Hello everyone, good afternoon. A, a, warm, a warm welcome to our second online webinar series. Thank you all for joining us. Um, the key focus of today's webinar is online child sexual abuse. And joining me, we have renowned academics and representative from a home office, the Home Office and the National Police Chiefs Can, uh, Council lead on child protection. Um, this webinar is a joint event between the UK Centre for Internet Safety Evidence Group, uh, the, Department, the Department of Digital Culture and Media and Sport, and the Marion Collins Foundation. Um, I'm Dr. Elena Martellozzo, criminologist from Middlesex University. And as the UK's representative, I'm delighted to be chairing this important event. So just allow me to explain what we do as a UK's evidence group. Um, we provide UK Centre for Internet Safety with current critical and rigorous account of the relevant research. Um, the group is formed of representatives from academia, government, NGOs and industry, and we meet regularly uh, to identify evaluate and commission new research relevant to child internet safety. Uh, now, just a little bit of housekeeping. I'm sure that you're all familiar with the feature uh, of uh, this platform. So just let me remind you that here at the bottom, you have Q&A facilities. So feel free to type any questions throughout the event. Uh, my colleagues and I will be monitoring the chat and ask the speakers to kindly answer a selection of the questions that you post. Now, I'm aware that uh, amongst uh, all the audience here, we've got practitioners working closely with young people, we've got charities, teachers, and many, many parents. So I sincerely hope that you will find this debate insightful and that you'll be able to take home some helpful key messages. Now, at this stage, let's start with the event. I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker to officially open the event, uh, Professor Julia Davidson uh, from the University of East London and director of the Institute for Connected Communities. Julia is also the chair of the UCAS Evidence Group. Uh, so thank you for opening the event, Julia. Uh, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Elna. I'm delighted to be opening this event today. And I just wanted to say, a few words before I hand over to our speakers. The aim of the webinar is to raise awareness about the issue of online child sexual abuse, which may be referred to throughout this webinar as online CSA, particularly in the context of the pandemic. We acknowledge that the benefits children gain from being online are enormous, and the aim of this webinar is not to cause alarm, but rather to consider research evidence and the practice experience in responding to online CSA and in responding to the needs of victims. It is important in acknowledging the benefits of the digital environment that we better understand the potential for harm to children and seek to mitigate risk through robust research informed safeguarding policy and practice. I've worked with child victims of CSA and practitioners in this area for over 30 years. And I'm currently the chair of the Research Ethics Committee of the UK Inquiry into Institutional CSA. It is clear to me as we learn more of the victim experience that the pain suffered is immeasurable and has in many cases remained hidden sometimes for many years and can be an enormous burden carried into adulthood. We also understand from our colleagues in policing that the pandemic has provided the context for an exponential increase and the amount of online CSA experienced by children, many of whom are now captive at home and increasingly online. Our speakers today will address these issues from different perspectives, considering research evidence and practice experience. Yesterday was Safer Internet Day, an annual global campaign. The theme was building an internet we trust. Building that trust is a responsibility shared by governments and industry. On the 4th of February 2021, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child adopted General Comment Number 25 in relation to children's rights in the digital environment. This is a landmark ruling as the UNCRC is the single most important overarching policy addressing children's rights, which now extends to the digital environment. 
One key right relevant for our discussion today is Article 19, which stipulates that governments must do all they can to ensure that children are protected from all forms of violence and abuse. In the UK, the online harms legislation will also be passed soon, which places a legal duty of care on online platforms to protect children from harm and online safety will form a part of the school curriculum in the future. The Home Office has published the Tackling Child Sexual Abuse Strategy, which was in part, I'm pleased to say, based upon research exploring offended behaviour conducted by Dr. Martellozzo, Dr. DiMarco and myself on behalf of the Centre of Expertise on Child Sexual Abuse. The strategy also draws upon recommendations from the independent inquiry into institutional CSA. We have a speaker from the Home Office, Victoria Jepson, who will doubtless elaborate on the strategy. Research evidence-based policy provides the framework upon which effective legislation should be based. These developments are very important as they signal both a recognition of the issue and the need to respond. It is vitally important, however, to ensure that policy informs legislation and practice at national level in the case of the UNCRC, and that its impact is monitored and evaluated so that there is not a disconnect between policy and the lived experience of victims. This is the challenge that we face. I also wanted to stress the importance of research in this area. Too little funding has in the past been devoted to online CSA. I am, however, very pleased to tell you that the Tech Coalition, in, co in collaboration with End Violence Against Children, has just launched the Safe Online Research Fund to fund key research in this area. But more research is needed if we are to better understand and confront online CSA. These and many other issues will be discussed by our expert presenters, and I'm now handing back to Eleanor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia, for your welcome address and for highlighting as well that uh, this is not to cause any concern. This webinar is really to raise awareness and the wonderful things that we are doing. A lot is happening, we heard. Last month, our Home Secretary published the Tackling Child Sexual Abuse Strategy that set out how the government will use new legislation and enhanced te technology to stop offenders from abusing children. It's therefore wonderful to have Victoria Jackson here from the Home Office. Victoria is the Head of Strategy, International and Knowledge Tackling Exploitation and Abuse Unit at the Home Office. Victoria, over to you. Hi, thank you. And thank you very much for having me here today. I think um, Julia's welcoming address really captured the, the context that um, I and my team and our colleagues are, are trying to deliver this policy within. So a re really important point raised in that um, for us to, it's always helpful for us to remember why we work on the policy areas we do and just in this vitally important area. So thank you for that, Julia. Um, as you say, the Tackling Child Sexual um, abuse strategy was published this month by the Home Office. Uh, in fact, in January, gosh, we're in February already. That shows how this year is going, I think, doesn't it? Um, but I'll start, um, as I'm sure you're all aware, just a, a brief overview of sort of the scale, nature and impact of child sexual abuse, which is kind of the context which informed the strategy. So um, we know that child sexual abuse can happen anywhere within the family, within institutions, uh, in our communities or orchestrated by criminal gangs. Um, or by those hiding online, which obviously are particularly relevant for this seminar. Um, and we know that child sexual abuse uh, can have lifelong impacts on victims and survivors, um, regardless of the type of abuse suffered, uh, including if the abuse is in an online environment, for example. Um, and we know that it affects the physical, emotional um, and mental health of victims and survivors. Uh, and we know it can go on to impact on uh, future relationships, socioeconomic outcomes, um, and vulnerability to re-victimisation, so a truly horrendous crime. Um, in terms of the impact of COVID-19, it was touched upon in the opening address, and whilst we cannot yet know the true impact of COVID-19 because the conditions are still, you know, in our society, and those conditions for um, abuse to take place within it are, are still very much, you know, in society, um, the government does recognise that the necessary measures to stop the spread of COVID-19 virus may have increased certain forms of um, child sexual abuse. Uh, and we know from stakeholders you know, involved in this webinar and beyond that with children spending an increasing amount of time online, 
it's not just online sexual grooming that's taking place, but it's criminal exploitation and beyond. So um, it's really important that we stay alive to the, the changing nature um, of the crimes in the online space particularly. So within that context, um, the abuse of the um, publication of our strategy was particularly timely. Um, the publication was pushed back to actually to ensure that we could reflect the impact of COVID-19 on, on a number of the actions and priorities that we had already identified as part of our scoping work. Um, so the UK is, is recognised as a global leader in tackling child sexual abuse, and rightly so. Uh, we've made significant steps in our efforts to tackle this crime. Um, however, as our response has improved, uh, so too has our understanding of the scale and nature uh, and the involving nature of this threat, as I say. Um, the strategy, it outlines the action we've taken so far in terms of tackling uh, child sexual abuse, but also in response to COVID-19 particularly. Um, it sets out work to keep children safe online whilst at home, and it also sets out how we will, we will go further uh, in our efforts to tackle all forms of child sexual abuse. Um, Part of this work has included, as you say, uh, as Julia said in the opening address, introducing the groundbreaking online harms bill, uh, which will ensure technology companies are held to account uh, and play their role in keeping children safe online. Um, there's commitments around strengthening our law enforcement and intelligence services and equipping them with the technology and world leading tools um, to, to tackle the threat. Um, we've also committed uh, to preventing abuse uh, in the first place, isn't that the, the ultimate ideal really in all of this? Um, but part of that includes by raising awareness through communications um, and engagement with parents, carers um, and the wider public um, to, to try and, and prevent abuse happening in the first place. Um, we've also made commitments around providing victims and survivors uh, with the support needed to rebuild their lives as well. Um, so that's that's a brief snapshot of this quite wide ranging strategy, as, as I'm sure you'll understand. And um, broadly speaking, I won't dig into the detail too much, noting time, uh, and I want to leave room for experts to speak as part of the wider panel as well. But uh, the strategy is based on three overarching objectives. Uh, the first is tackling all forms of child sexual abuse and bringing offenders to justice. Um, the second objective is preventing offending uh, and preventing reoffending, importantly as well. Uh, and the third is uh, protecting and safeguarding children and young people and supporting all victims and survivors. Um, they're big aims and the strategy captures our long term ambitions to tackle this crime. Um, it's outlined sort of initial steps we've taken and concrete steps we've taken to step up our response. Um, but it also provides a, a sort of robust framework for government as a whole, noting it's not just one department that can tackle this, it, is, it needs to be a cross government, cross partners uh, effort. Um, and we want to make sure we're driving action across all agencies, all sectors of society um, as a whole to carry on strengthening our response to all forms of child sexual abuse. Um, I, I do have some slides I could share after this as well, if that would be helpful, but I, I didn't circulate in advance, mainly due to timings. Um, what I would say, I guess, to, um, to conclude is that the context of COVID-19 and the strain it is placing on our frontline services, third sector partners, children and families, um, and the potentially heightened risk of certain forms of abuse, um, we feel make this strategy all the more timely. Um, and we're committed to continue working with third sector partners um, to understand the realities on the ground to make sure we implement the strategy effectively as well. Um, a, co a question that's come up quite a lot is sort of timeframes for the strategy and we deliberately didn't put a, a timeframe on it because it is a long term ambition, but we also recognise the need that the strategy will need refreshing in the future to make sure that our commitments and our understanding, as I say, of, of the nature of, of the harm uh, is accurate and that we are therefore pushing activity to, to meet that, that threat, basically, and to ensure that we are safeguarding children effectively. Um, so that might be a question that comes up that I'm happy to, to touch on further. Um, I hope that's a helpful overview of the strategy. And as I say, I'm very happy to uh, pick up specifics uh, as part of the Q&A session as well. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. It's great to hear about this strategy directly from you. And yes, if you have any slides, I will be emailing all the participants so they can they can see them. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, now, it's, uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce you to our first panel uh, focusing on research, um, which I have the pleasure to moderate as well. 
But before I introduce you to our speakers, um, let me show you a very short video uh, of online young people's experiences uh, of sexual harassment and exploitation. This is the courtesy of the project The Shame, uh, which uh, Dr. Bryce will be talking about later. can't hear the I'm not sure why I'm sorry you couldn't hear anything, <laughs> uh, but luckily there was a little bit of subtitles there and uh, um, what I can do as well is uh, forward you the link to the lovely video, uh, again uh, courtesy of the Project De Shame. Uh, now, let me introduce you to Dr. Joe Bryce, a senior lecturer at the School of Psychology, University of Central Lancashire. Over to you, and thank you again for sharing the, uh, the findings with us. Okay, um, thank you, and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. And what I'm going to do is talk about peer-related online sexual harassment. And I just really want to put that briefly in the context, the broader context, if you like, of online sexual abuse. Um, there is a tendency amongst um, how we think about online sexual abuse as it being related to adult to child exploitation. Um, but unfortunately, we know that young people also experience harmful sexual behaviour and interactions with their peers in the online environment. And some of the behaviours that we see young people engaging in together or, or involving each other actually are very similar to what we see in relation to how adult offenders um, interact with young people online in abusive situations. Um, and also we can see that there are similarities in terms of the impacts and the outcomes for young people to be exploited um, and abused in this way. So what I think this really shows is that to effectively address online sexual abuse, we need to recognise that it can also involve peers. Um, and so what I'm going to do in the rest of the um, time that I've got is share some learning from Project DSHAME, talk about some of the research that we've done and highlight some of the resources um, which uh, you saw, if not heard, <laughs> an example of um, before and to just give you an indication of the work of the project. Now, obviously the COVID lockdown issue has raised issues around this. And again, I hope 
that in a way, despite all of the negativity around that, it's, it's brought that kind of issue back to the agenda uh, in the context of the Home Office, um, you know, and the new strategies and things like that, and will give us some more impetus to move forward. <clears throat> so, in terms of uh, the first slide, if you could. Okay, um, so yeah, so we can move on to the next slide actually. <laughs> it's technology, it's brilliant. Okay, um, so just to give you a bit of background to Project DShame, um, the project actually came about um, because uh, we were aware that um, you know, young people were experiencing harmful sexual behavior online. They were experiencing kind of online sexual harassment that involved peers. Um, and that kind of range of behavior that we were hearing about from young people and from stakeholders was broader than what we commonly think of in relation to risky sexual behavior online for young people. So sexting and non-consensual sharing and things like that. So with the project, we basically set out to actually understand um, online sexual harassment amongst young people. We had two phases of the project. One phase actually looked at ages nine to 12 and the second looked at age uh, 13 to 17. And the kind of rationale behind that was to develop that evidence base around what young people were experiencing in the long online environment, how they felt about that, um, and kind of barriers to seek, seeking help and things like that, so that we could use that to develop and evaluate educational resources which address this particular issue. And the key focus that the, we had in the project was co-creation. So basically involving young people at all parts of the project to help us to design the research that we did, to reflect and review the research findings that we found, and then to help us create the educational resources that we actually developed. And one of the key things, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, <laughs> of the aim of the resources was to increase reporting to encourage victims and witnesses to actually seek help and to tell somebody if they were suffering in this way and obviously to work with other stakeholders other agencies that were involved in preventing and responding to this issue to actually try uh, to kind of work more effectively um, so just briefly to define online sexual harassment we used a very very broad definition in our project. It was basically unwanted sexual conduct on any platform. It does involve young people, so it's peer related. And in fact, it can involve any kind of content and communication amongst young people, whether that's on public or private platforms. So any technology, any kind of content that is unwanted and sexual. Now, the behaviours are largely based around schools and local communities, but obviously have this active online audience and that creates its own challenges and its own problems with these types of behaviors because you have a much bigger potential audience and that can actually intensify the negative impacts. And the negative impacts that we've identified are that people who are targeted can feel threatened, exploited, coerced, um, upset, et cetera, et cetera. So that was kind of the general definition that we developed. And within that, we actually specified four subcategories of behavior. The first of those was the traditional or, or the more well-known sets of behavior around sexting, um, sharing sexual images, and um, maybe in the context of a relationship between young people, something like that. And then that content being shared more widely. And we asked young people aged 13 to 17 about some of these uh, behaviors. This data is from the UK only. It's not from our, um, uh, it's not a European level um, set of data. So we found, for example, that 13% of our sample had sent images to a partner and 10% had sent them to somebody else. 12% were pressured to share images by a partner and 6% had had their sexual images shared without consent. The other categories that we had, one was sexual sexualized bullying. So that was bullying that was around sexual gossip about actual or perceived behavior, sexual rumors and uh, rumors perhaps and being targeted around sexual orientation. So we found, for example, that 12% of our sample said that they've been bullied online using homophobic or transphobic language. 
The third category that we had was exploitation, coercion and threats. Fairly straightforward, unfortunately, uh, young people receiving um, kind of sexual threats or being blackmailed on the basis of the images that they shared and coerced into further sexual um, activity. And we found, for example, that 8% of the sample said that they'd received sexual threats online, uh, and that included uh, rape threats and things like that. The final category was unwanted sexualization, and that was basically around um, young people being sent content, um, images, videos, or, or comments or requests uh, that were sexual that they did not want. So that's really just to give you an overview of the different behaviours that were involved. And I think actually we can see that some of those behaviours have parallels with the types of behaviours that we see adult offenders engage, engaging in when they're in that process of exploiting young people online. And another thing, of course, to note there is um, that for young people who are engaged in these behaviours, there's obviously a case for examining more why they're engaging in those behaviours and considering kind of what might be behind them and uh, trying to address those before they perhaps um, develop into adult offending. We also asked young people about their responses uh, what they would do if they experienced um, online sexual harassment and we found that the most popular was response was to block the people that were involved in the harassing behavior. Uh, a large proportion, nearly 70% said that they would tell friends, 53% said they would, would ignore it, only about 40% of the sample said that they would tell a parent or carer and only 15% said they would tell a teacher. So obviously what we're seeing here is about half of young people saying that they wouldn't tell an adult if they experience this. And given the nature of the behaviours that can be involved and the types of actions that need to be taken, this is actually quite concerning. So we asked around the barriers to seeking help. Why didn't young people feel that they could come forward to do that? And the most popular um, barrier that young people kind of agreed with was feeling too embarrassed about telling somebody because of the nature of the behaviours that they are sexual or that the comments are actually sexual. Um, the second most popular concern was being worried what would happen next. So if I tell somebody that my um, sexual image has been shared around school, what's going to happen to that? Who's going to see it? Do my parents see the image? Will um, the teachers see it? Those kinds of questions. And the third most popular was being worried about being targeted by those that uh, were involved. So this is a really quick overview of, of our research results, but what we had from this was a steer about the behaviours to focus on and also a steer on uh, the need to increase awareness of who young people can go to to ask for help and also uh, the need to address these concerns around uh, the barriers to reporting. So in terms of the educational resources, we used the information that we had from our research and our evidence base to develop two separate campaigns. The first is Step Up, Speak Up. That's for young people aged 13 to 17. The second campaign is Just a Joke, and that's for nine to 12 year olds. And that's actually only been um, released at the end of January. So the two um, campaigns focus on slightly different categories of behavior. So for the younger children, we're more focused on bullying that's around sexual development, changes in body appearance and jokes going too far. Whereas for um, the campaign for the older young people, um, we're looking at more deliberately or, or clearly um, sexual behaviors like non-consensual sharing, coercive behavior and things like that. But both of the sets of resources focus on getting young people to reflect on their attitudes and experiences of these types of behaviours online, to recognise where there are problems, to give them some strategies around challenging unacceptable online behaviour that they may see, and to reinforce where they can go for help and what will happen when that actually happens. And we put a lot of... Um, kind of time into making sure that the resources are easy to use. They are primarily based around school delivery and there is guidance around um, the resources, how to use them, how to feel confident for the person delivering them around talking about these issues and obviously the uh, safeguarding issues that are associated with talking in class with these around these types of things. 
and the exercises, the lesson plans, the assembly plans, the quizzes are all very practical, they're very interactive, and they're based on real life scenarios that we found from our research um, and from um, talking to helplines and different agencies. So essentially we wanted to produce something that young people can engage with, and this was where our youth advisory boards in the different countries came into play. They gave us really good steer on making sure that we matched up um, what we were trying to achieve and the look and the feel of the resources into that kind of, um, kind of context that the young people could relate to. So um, realistically, that is a very, very quick overview of Project D-Shame, and I totally didn't see how I was doing for time. I'd like to invite you all to go onto the website and have a look at the resources. Uh, there are some parents' resources there also now, and the resources can be adapted so that they can be developed in other um, locations and contexts. So I guess just to bring it back to the main kind of point that I started out with, um, really online sexual harassment does have overlaps with adult to child sexual exploitation and I think that moving forward in terms of um, prevention and response strategies we need to ensure that young people can also recognize that exploitative sexual behavior online can actually involve their peers also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much Jo for sharing your findings with us. Uh, I'm a big supporter of DeShame and I've been following it throughout its history and it's good to see that it's coming to an end. Thank you. So our next speaker, uh, Dr. Jeffrey DeMarco. Um, Jeffrey is a forensic psychologist. He's a senior fellow at the Center for Abuse and Trauma Study, CATS at Middlesex University, and a research director at Natsen in social research. Jeffrey, over to you, please. Thank you, Elena. Um, thank you very much for that kind introduction and um, for the privilege of speaking at today's event. Um, only eight minutes to fit in 15 years worth of research experience and lessons learnt. Um, and what I've tried or what I'm going to try and communicate today to everyone is a combination of findings and strategies and things to think about that is accessible to the range and diverse members of the audience today. So I want to talk to parents today. I want to talk to other researchers, both in academia and in the policy space. And I want to speak to, to teachers. Um, and I want the lessons that have come out of my own research with different groups to be able to feed into their own thinking and to inform research and practice moving forward. So I think the first challenge we have as researchers in this space is focusing or prioritizing on what we need to do to prevent these harms from occurring to young people. A lot of my own research has focused on speaking to young people who have been victimized through child sexual abuse and exploitation, but also speaking to stakeholders, people that work in the third sector, police officers, teachers, parents, social workers, youth workers, and to perpetrators. And I think that as many of us who work in research that are listening to the discussion today would agree on is understanding offending, understanding victimization and understanding the impact of child sexual exploitation and abuse on wider society is important in forging the best preventative measures moving forward. I can't design something that speaks to safeguarding that helps parents protect their young people if I don't understand the motivations of offenders, if I don't understand why a young person was communicating with a stranger online. And don't take, don't take the lesson wrong here. I'm not suggesting that the young people have any form of responsibility in what's occurring to them whilst they're online, quite, quite the contrary. But it's important that we provide them with clear parameters, education, awareness, and knowledge to understand how to navigate this fascinating digital world. So to, to any youth groups that are listening today, to those educators that are working from reception all the way up to preparing for university admissions, there's certain challenges in doing research in this space that, that we really need to take on board that we often fail to recognize. And we fail to recognize these challenges for two reasons. Firstly, we find the digital space extremely overwhelming. All right, some people are like, no, I'm not a tech person. I don't really understand this app and that app. 
I am not comfortable delving into further information about this, so I'm going to feign ignorance, essentially. On the other side of things, there's issues around just, just the pure volume and overwhelming nature of the digital space. If we cast our eyes or minds back to late February, March 2020, when there was an explosion of new kind of voice over internet protocol apps for young people, for teachers, for parents, for families to use, not a lot of due diligence went into kind of checking whether these things had the safety features and the ethical tools that we would have needed to protect young people online. That's not blaming teachers, that's not blaming parents, not blaming anybody, except saying when we are faced with such a volume of content, we can be overwhelmed. We want to make sure that our young people are not falling behind, if you will, in terms of their digital immersion and engagement. So we want them to feel like they're participating in society. It's a fundamental feature of psycho psychological development, interacting and engaging with other people. In a lockdown, that's been very, very challenging. There's also the issue, and this is mostly speaking to you parents out there that may be listening, or to the teachers that might be kind of providing information to young people about staying safe online. And again, emerging from some of the research that I've worked with some of you that are on the call today over the last 10, 15 years. And it's the fact that young people are experts at technology use, whereas many of us aren't, or we're playing catch up the entire time. I'm sure you can all close your eyes and think about your own experiences with an older member of the family and trying to teach them that actually when you post that message on Facebook, everybody can see it. It's not as private as you may have thought it was. That message is so important when young people know more about the privacy features of social media applications and all the tools they're using versus their own parents and at times their teachers who do not necessarily speak in the same technological and digital language that these young people speak in. So to give you a, a very basic example about all of this, I cannot tell you how many times over the last 10 years I've either been conducting research or working with the police and being part of an interview with a young person who's been exploited or has been abused online. And when you ask them why it happened, they often say, I didn't know, I don't know why, I got carried away. When you ask their parent what they think they could have done differently, the parents often say, I have no idea. We thought they were safe. They were upstairs in their bedroom, just playing on their phone. So again, right? That's one of the things in terms of online harms and online child sexual abuse and exploitation is some of the more foundational safety mechanisms we would have used to protect our young people from societal harms, such as supervision and monitoring, we take for granted because they're still under our roof. They're in the next room. We don't actually appreciate sometimes the access to the global world our young people have or that potential opportunistic perpetrators have in reaching them. So the one recommendation that I have for everybody listening today, and it's something that I've, I've learned quite importantly as I've straddled both academic research and policy-based research for the last five years in particular, and it's the importance of the evidence base and it's the importance of program evaluation. A few weeks ago, I gave a lecture to a group of master students on forensic psychology who had never really had any teaching or content about online harms, online risk assessment, online prevention, online treatment. And what was fascinating with the, with the lecture is that I set my students the task to spend about half an hour to go online and to identify programs within Wales that were offering information about online safety for young people, for teachers, and for parents. And fascinatingly enough, what came back was a plethora of good programs that are operating out there. Many of you listening in today are probably managing some of these things as a one man or one woman band operating something to teach parents and teachers about the key tools in staying safe online. And my hope to everyone listening today is that we do more to demonstrate the impact of some of these programs. 
All right, we look at what these programs are doing for the outcomes of young people. I don't want to fear monger and I don't want any of you listening today to fear monger. The internet is a fantastic, useful technological tool, but what we really, really need to do is demonstrate good programs, good projects that are providing educational awareness to young people, to their parents and to teachers so that they can competently and confidently have conversations about what could happen online, what the risks of abuse and exploitation actually are and what to do if you find yourself in a difficult situation. One of the recommendations we made for some research about 18 months ago was to start using language and the narrative with young people who had been groomed and posted a picture or produced a video for an online perpetrator was to help them start to think about the fact that actually, yes, that image, that video is now on the internet. The UK is a leading jurisdiction in tackling online child sexual abuse and exploitation, second to none, I would argue, having worked in this field for a long time. And we need to have the awareness amongst these key people so that they know where to seek help, how to get support, how to build up their knowledge base and their awareness and what to do if things do go wrong. It's possible that video goes onto the internet. It's possible that that photograph goes onto the internet. It's possible that multiple offenders may look at that content, but there is also life after the experience of victimization and it's helping young people make these educated decisions knowing what the risks are, knowing what the consequences are, but first and foremost, knowing where they need to go to seek help, to be supported, and to not feel like they are alone. So that's my discussion for today, kind of lessons learned from research across perpetrators, police officers, young people, frontline staff that are working to ameliorate online safety for these individuals. And I urge everyone listening today, whether you work for government, whether you work for a social research organization, if you're an academic doing research, to remember there's a lot of good work going on out there and that we all need to play our part together in order to protect and make the online environment a safe place for our youth. Thank you very much, Elena. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you. I love your positivity, you know, with this really kind of dark uh, subject. Um, so we've got 10 minutes for question and answers. We've received a few questions there, um, which I'd like to ask, if I may. So yesterday was Internet Safety Day, and we heard how 2020, more than ever, has been so significant, um, particularly the online, our online lives have become more, uh, more pronounced uh, during this period. And it's wonderful to hear uh, that we are embracing uh, our digital lives so positively. I mean, we're here today in a webinar with, um, you know, so many people attending, which is great. Um, so may I ask you both, Jeffrey and Joe, and I can bring in Victoria as well, if I may, what are the lessons learned from this period, from COVID-19 to take forward when we go back to normality? if there's going to be a normality. Um, shall, I, shall I kick yes. off? Is that okay? Yeah, Victoria? definitely, please go ahead. Um, please well, do. Elena, as you know, we, you and I have had quite a few conversations about this with multiple individuals. Um, and I think something I touched upon early in my, in my discussion was this idea that technology, <laughs> this is, you know, I mean, sucking on eggs here, but technology is always evolving. Right. And one of the challenges we have in trying to safeguard and protect young people online is that they're they speak the digital language better than the majority of us do. Right. And so they know what cool new app or what cool new medium to use before we find out about it, or at least we are competent with it. So what I do think is important post COVID as is that we demystify the online space. We help parents, caregivers, and teachers, and I, I'm, I'm really quite firm on this, on the element with the teachers, feel the competence and confidence to have 
discussions about technology with their young people, right? They don't need to be as, as, as um, articulate about that Facebook thing or that TikTok device, right? I don't need them to necessarily be the expert, but I want them to be able to perhaps co-learn with the young people, have the young people teach them about the features and have the adults and the educators and the parents provide the safety messaging and provide an environment in where those young people feel safe to approach that teacher, approach that care, approach that parent to go, hey, somebody asked me something really inappropriate, you know, on that device or that platform we were talking about, what should I do? Thank you. Thank you. Victoria, do you have anything you'd like to add to Jeffrey's uh comment? Yeah, I, I would totally agree with that. And I guess it, it's about having the honest conversation. You don't want to scaremonger, do you? Because if you, if you, I, I'm not a parent myself, but having, you know, my own relationship with parents, if my parents told me not to do something or not to go on a platform because it's scary and dangerous and there's bad people, the first thing I do is I'm going to go and look at that platform. So you want to create that honest conversation and, and not restrict children from using devices or, you know, uh, platforms that their friends are on, absolutely, but just being mindful of the risks and having that uh, informed conversation as a partnership as well. You know, it, it, it should be a two-way dialogue so a child feels able to talk to your parent, you know, if, if you're a bit worried about something, as Jeffrey was saying, but likewise for parents to say, look, I know you want to create an account there, but let's just think about the wider implications of this and maybe what safety measures we might be able to put on in order for you to have that account and be able to talk to your friends. At, um, and, and I think it's, it is about balance and that a two-way discussion. Yeah, I've got loads of questions here. So fascinating. I'm sure you can see them. But so, Joe, before you, 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 you jump in, can I ask you this specific question that could, you could help with? Um, here we've got uh, from Irene saying that responsibility should be shared by young people, those over the age of 16. As they approach adulthood, they cannot be excused that they did not know something or what they're doing that harm what they cause to other. I think this fits really well with your project, doesn't it? This comment. Yep. Um, I mean, one of the key things that we've tried to do in the resources and the research that we've done is to kind of get people to think about the behavior of peers. So it's all about the online community. It's all about the online relationships. Um, and it's all about trying to get young people to have those discussions around what's acceptable and what isn't. Um, and, you know, we do see, particularly when you get into that 16 to 18 year old category, it becomes a lot murkier because, you know, the behaviors are moving towards adulthood and things like that. But we have tried to, and the young people that we spoke to told us very much, it's a community. We can look at, we can look after ourselves and police ourselves to a certain extent within that bigger context of feeling confident that we can go and speak to adults to actually get, you know, sort of the help when we need it. So I think shared responsibility really is key. And actually that kind of should be built into the educational resources and approaches that we take even for younger children you know it's everyone's responsibility to try and not upset harm or hurt people when they're interacting with their peers online so I think trying to get young people to reflect on that is really important and one of the things we found was that the young people who took part in the evaluation that we did after they'd done the lesson said we've never had an opportunity to sit down and really talk about these issues and think about them before and they really enjoyed the opportunity to do that so I think those kinds of approaches can encourage that shared responsibility and get people who haven't necessarily thought about the impact of their behavior to actually really think about it in more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Look, I'm really conscious of time and we have another wonderful panel to be that deserves time as well. So it's my pleasure now to introduce you to the second panel, which is going to be moder moderated by uh, my colleague Ting Palmer, uh, the founder and CEO of the Mary Collins Foundation. Ting, over to you. Thank you so much, Eleanor, and welcome to everybody who's, who's with us today. And so great to see so many parents who are going to be hopefully joining us in debates in the future as well as, as today. I've got two very dear colleagues who are on the panel who are going to be presenting 
today and do you know do be sure that you <clears throat> ask all relevant questions you want to ask us that's what we're here for we want to get the debate going as much as we can because we do want to ensure that the messages we got from the children in the shame project for example is they want to feel safe and i guess it's our duties all our duties to try and do that so the first speaker my colleague vic baines is going and we're going to look at policy and practice issues in this in this section so over to you vic thanks very much tink um and stuart if we could get the the slides up that would be fantastic thank you and apologies in advance to you because i think i'm going to speed you through these given the the time constraints um, look, we're in the middle of a public health emergency, and I think it's fair to say that we are all suffering from being on high alert for quite a considerable extended period of time now. And so we are understandably concerned about the risks to children. Um, Julia's set the scene very well. Uh, in terms of the need even more so now for evidence-based policy. Um, and we have a leading assumption for everything that we do that a robust evidence base makes policy more effective. Now, all the stakeholders that you will encounter working in um, online child protection are keen to have and produce numbers, and particularly when it comes to how big is the problem, because how big the problem is determines um, the funding that we get, the projects we can start, um, and the strategies that we can deploy. Um, but I think we need a bit of a reality check here, and that is that there is no single measure at the moment for the prevalence of online child sexual exploitation and abuse. And what researchers and analysts have to do is they have to piece together all of the partial information that multiple stakeholders have. Um, so we have that task to piece it together, but we also, I think, all of us have a responsibility to be transparent with members of the public, parents, caregivers, educators, about the limitations with that data, what it means, and what it doesn't. So I set myself a task that I know many of us are concerned about at the moment, something of a, an investigative task, if you like, and it's to try and answer the question, has online grooming increased in the UK due to COVID-19? And researchers on the call, you will know um, that I have phrased this in a very particular way to test a particular working hypothesis. So the next slide, please. And if you were to look at just news media coverage, you would be forgiven for thinking um, that grooming has inevitably gone up because there is a general tone um, of greater risk to children in the UK during lockdown. We're gonna to jump to the next slide again. Um, so I have a background in logic and rhetoric, and whenever I look at arguments like this, I try to unpack them, break them up into their constituent parts, and I could do an entire presentation on the dialectic here, the logic that we're using, but just to unpack it very briefly, we are assuming that being online is an inherently risky business, that more time online increases the risk to children, that because children have spent more time online during lockdown, online grooming in the UK has therefore increased. So next slide, please. So when we're trying to identify prevalence and incidence of online child sexual exploitation and abuse, we inevitably have our first recourse to recorded crime. And some of you will uh, recognize this headline from the Telegraph in November, online grooming offenses rose during lockdown, police reveal. Now this is actually a freedom of information request um, that was made by the NSPCC and we can jump to the next slide. And with apologies, because we're not going to be able to go through all of these numbers, um, but uh, you will have the recording and I'm very, very happy to share these slides with any of you afterwards so that you can scrutinize this data more closely. But what I did is I took the data from the NSPCC, um, initially showing that the freedom of information responses from 38 police forces in England and Wales, showing that there were 1,220 offences of sexual communication with a child in the first three months of lockdown. And they also provided um, data for the previous three years uh, for that particular offence. Now, very, very briefly, we need to draw attention to the fact that not all forces have responded. In the first three years from 2017, there were 42 out of 43 forces in England and Wales, 
38 forces for the first three months of lockdown. So already we've got an incomplete data set. And as Simon and others will tell you, we've also not got all offences recorded here because uh, the offence of sexual communication with a child, actually quite a recent introduction uh, from 2017. So that's why we only have data from 2017. Um, it doesn't include the other grooming offences, so section 14, arranging to meet a child for sexual abuse, and section 15, meeting a child for sexual abuse. This is just section 15A. Now, when I crunch this data to try and make sense of the fact that we have disparities between the number of forces, I thought, well, let's bring this down to a monthly average per responding force. And don't forget that in the previous headline in the Telegraph, it said that this particular offence had increased during lockdown. And if we bring it down to the monthly average per responding force, actually we see an increase from uh, the last financial year, 2019 to 2020, um, to those first three months in lockdown of 0.6 of an offence per responding force, which is an increase, but is actually less of an increase than on previous years, where um, 2018 to 2019, there was a 44% increase we're talking about the science of small numbers here, of course, and then 19 to 20, a 10% increase on the previous year. So yes, there is an increase, but being able to say that there was a disproportionate increase because of lockdown is not so easy to establish. Okay, so then we have reports to hotlines, and some of you will have seen uh, the reports to the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children, NECMEC. Um, they process many millions of reports a year of OXIA, mostly in relation to child abuse images. 16.9 million reports in 2019, and we're waiting for the full 2020 data set. They have published data showing that online enticement reports um, between January the 1st and September the 30th pretty much doubled um, from the same period in 2019. But it's really important to state that we don't know from this public data how many of those reports related to the UK. So we're not able to say in that data set um, what the increase was for UK online enticement. If we go to the Internet Watch Foundation's data, which has also received a considerable media coverage, um, they reported a 77% increase in self-generated child sexual abuse content. But they say themselves that it, it's only in some of those cases that that would involve grooming, so solicitation of a child by an adult deception or extortion into producing and sharing a sexual video or image of themselves. So in that sense, we're not much closer to being able to answer the specific research question. And then, of course, we also have um, coverage to some extent of um, talk in the dark web about uh, wanting to uh, contact children more than previously. Um, and the NSPCC refers to Europol's report of a surge in attempts by offenders to contact young people on social media. But we have to be clear, don't we, that talking about offending, um, particularly in the context of offences in which fantasy is known to play uh, quite a considerable part, is not the same as actually abusing children. Okay, so it's, it's all quite confusing so far, and we have other considerations. Um, as a number of speakers before have mentioned, and as the um, de-shame children and young people can tell you better than I ever could, there are considerable barriers to reporting, and we therefore presume that there is considerable under-reporting. But we also need to bear in mind that more people reporting doesn't necessarily mean a greater incidence of abuse. Um, equally, uh, we know from Interpol's report on COVID-19 and child sexual abuse um, that there has been an impact, according to law enforcement around the world, on their capacity to respond to child sexual exploitation and abuse. From the Net Clean report, um, which interviews a number of um, specialist police officers around the world, we know that 48% of the UK police surveyed said that cases of online CSA such as grooming and sexual extortion had increased during the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, of course, as those of us who uh, were involved in voting for the Brexit referendum know, 48% of people who say that there was means that there were 52% who didn't say that there was. 
Um, and if we break that down um, ever so slightly, um, we can see that 19% of those interviewed said that it was unchanged and 33% either said that they didn't know or that there was a reduction. And that 12% of the total survey respondents who were UK police officers actually works out at 56.4 police officers. So it's a inc very incomplete data set. We also have heard reports um, that US tech company operations have been impacted due to reduced human review um, because people have had to work from home in companies like Facebook and Twitter and TikTok. They've not been able to access the secure systems to review the child abuse material. And that has meant greater automation and greater numbers of mistakes being made. So false positives, but also could potentially impact on the number of reports coming through from those companies to NECMEC in 2020. And we also know um, that there are other considerations that could uh, contribute to reporting after concerns are realised. Um, so the Stop It Now helpline help run by the Lucy Faithful Foundation, of which, full disclosure, I am a trustee, um, they actually reported a rise in contact after the first lockdown eased in July, which I think is really, really interesting. Uh, there was a 51% increase in um, people calling the helpline to report concerns about um, adults' behaviour um, that they were aware of, and then a doubling of reports about young people's potentially problematic behaviour. Um, and that would suggest, doesn't it, that um, being in proximity with these people may actually be a barrier to reporting at the time, but as lockdown eases, it's possible, it's a working hypothesis, let's say, um, that there, there may be a greater freedom to report after lockdown. So it's not necessarily the case um, that reports are made exactly when concerns um, are raised. So going back to a really important point that Jeffrey made and that Joe made as well, um, really our best first-hand evidence about incidents comes from children and young people. But here too, the data doesn't quite fit the bill yet. Um, Ofcom and the Information Commissioner's Office report on online harms um, did interview children aged, uh, young people aged between 12 and 15, but unfortunately the field work ended on the 11th of February, 2020. Um, EU Kids Online, Global Kids Online, that's probably the, the largest scale and the most comprehensive survey of young people's experiences, but unfortunately the UK wasn't included in the 2020 survey. We also have um, an NSPCC Commission survey by Family and Kids and Youth, um, young people aged 11 to 17, um, and that reported that one in 25 11 to 17 year olds have sent, received, or been asked to send con uh, sexual content to an adult. But again, that was published in 2019, so it doesn't quite fit our time frame. So, has online grooming increased in the UK due to COVID-19? Uh, well, I think Victoria answered the question for you right at the start. We don't yet know, really. Um, and that takes us back to risk. And maybe that's not such a bad place to be. Um, the logic that I presented to you earlier, it presumes, doesn't it, um, that risk equates with abuse. Um, and that presumes that we can't build children's resilience, that they will inevitably become victims purely through being online. But we know that's, of course, not true. That's why um, you know, we spend so much time and effort and resources on education and awareness programs. Um, now, I'm going to finish, if I may, with a very, very brief uh, anecdote. And it's something that reassures me on a daily basis. Um, when I worked at SEOP, I was the principal analyst. And back in the days before artificial intelligence, it was my job to review all of the public reports that came in every month. And I had to read um, all of the reports manually. And the most striking one that I think we ever received in my time there was from a six-year-old girl. Uh, and she had been approached on Club Penguin by someone she didn't know who asked her to um, strip on webcam and to send some images to them. 
Um, and that was a very, very concerning situation, of course. Um, and I can't remember the words verbatim, but certainly um, it included something like, um, I spoke to my mummy and my mummy told me that there was someone I could report to who would help us when somebody asked me to do something online that I didn't like and made me upset. And so she helped me fill in this form and we decided to report to you. Um, and that's hugely reassuring for me, and I hope it is for you, that we still have an opportunity to build that resilience, even though we don't know the exact prevalence of grooming uh, during lockdown or um, due to COVID-19 lockdown. What we can absolutely do is build that resilience and empower children and young people um, to reach out, exactly as Jeffrey described, um, and to challenge the behaviour and the unwanted experiences that they have online. And with that, I will thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you so much, Vic. Um, as ever, challenging, making us question, which is just what we all need to do. Um, but going back to your, your um, case example you gave at the end, um, Mary Collins Foundation, we work with children who have been harmed online and we help them recover and to live safe and fulfilling lives. And we know how difficult it is actually still for children to say anything about what's happened to them online. And it's difficult for children who are sexually abused within the community offline to actually say what's happening to them. But online, there seems to be a sort of double whammy effect because they feel guilty and they feel people can see what they've been up to. So I guess one of the challenges for all of us, whether we're parents, teachers, social workers, police officers or whatever, how can we make it easier and enable children to actually be able to come forward and know that they're going to be listened to and not told off for their activities? Having said that, I'm now going to move on to, again, another dear colleague who is in fact the president of our charity and um, a very, very valued member of the whole safeguarding community throughout the UK and further afield. So Simon Bailey, Chief Constable of Norfolk Constabulary, over to you, Simon. Tink, uh, thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone that's joining uh, this afternoon. Uh, I've listened uh, fascinated to uh, all the speakers this afternoon, and I hope I can now uh, build on what you've heard already. So next slide, please. So just in terms of uh, online child sexual exploitation and abuse, I think everybody would, would know what that is. And today it is uh, pertinent, the timing of this, of this uh, seminar in that uh, an offender is appearing at uh, Ipswich uh, Crown Court this afternoon, uh, charged with the grooming of 96 uh, uh, children, but actually uh, we can show that David Wilson uh, reached out and contacted 5,000 children around the world during his period of offending. He groomed online 500 children and this afternoon faces 96 uh, charges. A large number of the children that Wilson groomed uh, actually come from my own force area. And there is no doubt that when you, you look at the particular case that we've dealt with with Wilson uh, today and the sentencing of him, I think it brings home to roost the challenge that we face uh, around the threat of, of online grooming. He is just but one offender. Next slide, please. The independent inquiry into child sexual abuse has uh, done a huge amount of research during the lifetime of the project and there are just a number of the statistics which highlight the scale of the challenge and the impact that abuse has on on victims and survivors next slide please and just to give you some idea of the, of the scale of, of the challenge that, that we face uh, I've, i always use this statistic because i think it demonstrates just how much the world has changed in the last 30 years. In 1990, the Home Office undertook a study looking at the proliferation and the availability of indecent imagery of children, and there were a thousand uh, images in circulation. If you then go on to 1999, this figure had risen to 41,000. The Child Abuse Image Database now has 17 million unique images. So in 30 years, we've gone from 7,000 images 
now to 17 million unique images, and those numbers continue to grow every single month. Next slide, please. Forces have, have uh, undoubtedly responded to the threat, and I've, I'm really pleased to hear some of the recognition of, of our, our activity. I think we are world beaters uh, in this space. Uh, forces have developed online capabilities. We have regional networks, and we have done a huge amount with key stakeholders and partners in the space to ensure that we are doing everything to not only target the offenders, but also work with, with partners, the children of, of IOC offenders, because we know the impact that we have on a family when we arrest uh, what is invariably the, the paternal uh, leader of that, uh, of that particular family unit. Next slide, please. So there we are, there's the child abuse image database. Uh, we're adding half a million new images uh, every two months. 17 million images now, a key piece of technology which is assisting our fight to tackle the, the ever-growing threat of, of online abuse. And it's, it was very, very interesting uh, listening to the, the National Centre for Missing and Exploited uh, Children's Statistics. We know uh, now that in 2020, up to the end of October of that year, uh, NetMEC had received 20 million uh, referrals which was, uh, I believe, two and a half million more referrals than they'd had in the previous year. It just gives you some idea of what we are dealing with and will continue to have to deal with for this foreseeable future. Undercover officers online, there was a fantastic programme on Channel 4 uh, on Monday evening, followed by two further uh, hour-long programmes uh, on the next two consecutive Mondays, looking at the work of UCOL colleagues, looking at the work that we are doing, targeting people that, that groom, those statistics there uh, speak volumes. Next slide, please. So what have we, what have we done? What do we know about the, the, the threat of, of uh, indecent imagery? What do we know about the threat of child sexual abuse and exploitation? Uh, we know that there are now in the region of 300,000 adults with a sexual interest in children. And I think that's a conservative estimate and is going to continue to grow. We are one of the top three consumers of the live streaming paid for abuse of children in the Philippines. And we know and we can see from those statistics, the exponential percentage increases year on year that we have seen. Next slide, please. So what's been the police service response? Uh, going back to 2012, 2013, the CIOP NCA is now were responsible for coordinating fewer than 200 arrests in the whole of that year. On average, we are now dealing, unfortunately, with 850 offenders every month, and we are safeguarding uh, over a thousand children every month. But all I would say is that is a very hollow set of statistics. It's hollow because every month, the number of referrals continues to grow. The demand within the system continues to grow. And increasingly, we are having to, to deal with uh, growing volumes of not only the availability of additional imagery, but grooming and live grooming as well. Next slide, please. And when you look at uh, the, the challenges that we are faced there, uh, increasingly there are more and more people that are talking about their pathway to look, looking at child sexual abuse material, the crossover from extreme pornography, the normalization of behaviors, and we are doing our best not to criminalize a generation of young people through the use of outcome 21, where it's not in the public interest to prosecute uh, an individual that has produced their own sexual imagery, sexting being the, the, uh, the language that is frequently used. Next slide, please. So prevention is absolutely the key. I think we would all recognize that. I look at the work that the, the likes of Tink does with Marie Collins Foundation, the likes of Lucy Faithful Foundation, Circles, Stop, Stop So. We all have a commitment to try and do our best to stop the abuse in the first place and undoubtedly the passing into legislation of the online harms white paper is going to be the most important piece of legislation in this space because the tech companies that are responsible for permitting uh, the uploading, the sharing, the distribution of images that are responsible for permitting the grooming and the abuse of children online, undoubtedly, I don't believe are going to do anything until such time as the legislation is passed and, and Ofcom are given significant powers which those companies might then take up or sit by and take notice of. Next slide please. So there's the role of industry. Uh, it's possible to block child sexual abuse material. I believe that they can stop grooming 
and the live streaming. And I've seen examples of where they've been able to stop uh, grooming. But of course, we face perhaps the biggest challenge uh, of any at this moment in time with Facebook's plans to introduce end-to-end uh, -end encryption. Uh, that presents a, a big, big challenge and something that we are continually uh, raising with the tech company, because if they do that, they are going to turn the lights out on our ability to tackle the threat. Uh, so I hope I've, I've brought to life uh, a, lot of, a lot of what the academic research uh, has already uh, focused upon. We are the best in the world at tackling the threat. However, the threat continues to grow and our ability to be able to carry on arresting our way out of it is simply never, ever going to work. It was never going to work in the first place. The solution lies within a technical uh, solution. The solution lies with the tech companies taking their responsibility to prevent the uploading, the sharing of, of the material, and to make sure that all children can go online and be safe. That can, has to be complementary to the work that we can all do collectively as parents, guardians, and grandparents, because ultimately our children need to understand that the web is a place for exploration, it's a place where they should be able to go and use it safely. And we should be confident as parents and guardians that actually uh, they are not ever going to be a victim of, of exploitation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon. That's really so comprehensive in such a quick time and, and will really set the scene for, for all of us. But I've only got time for one question and, um, and one that I've often been asked, and um, which I could ask both Simon and, and um, Vic to, to come in on, is around looking at our current situation and into the future. How can we best protect children from online harms and who are the key players that need to be around the table? Um, and I can just say, for, for me, um, it seems that we're not putting out the right messages um, and information at times to, to families and particularly to protect their children. Because if you think about abusive imagery, people immediately think it's an online offence. Whereas of course the actual offending against the child Happens, and we know it happens mainly in domestic circumstances because that's what we see in these um, in, in the videos, etc., that, that we have to be involved with. So I'm wondering whether we need to think probably around who are we giving the messages to and what information are we giving that's going to be helpful to protect children. So if I, both of you could just a quick comment on that would be really useful. Vic? Yeah, so for me, um, I, I've spent a year um, mapping all of the functions required to respond to online child sexual exploitation and abuse and they are manifold you know we we have um, what the work that you do think with young people who have experienced um, sexual abuse we have primary secondary tertiary prevention with young people um, with the wider population but also with people who are at risk of offending um, there's the work if we think about the, the we protect global alliance model national response um, we need national specialist law enforcement units which not all countries have we need hotlines we need helplines for all sorts of different aspects and then we need to provide um, the support to parents, caregivers, educators. Um, tech companies, Simon is absolutely right. They, they have a responsibility to prevent this kind of offending and victimization, to um, detect and report that kind of offending and victimization. And I think to answer your question about the future, um, we have the possibility for artificially intelligent tools to intervene a lot more live time. That raises all sorts of interesting questions about the extent to which we should intrude in people's private communications. That speaks very much to Simon's point, of course, about end-to-end -end encryption. Um, so, you know, we have much more powerful tools potentially at our disposal, and there's a public debate now about the extent to which we should use them. Wonderful, thank you so much. I think I'm gonna to have to go back to uh, Elena straight away, because I know we're rushing, um, uh, rushing out of time very quickly, but thank you so much to both of you for your presentations and for your comments. Yes, thank you so much. I uh, can sense the passion that comes through all your work. Now, closing the event, I have one more final speaker. I would like to invite Mary Aiken. Uh, Mary is a professor of forensic cyber psychology at the University of East London. And she's also an adjunct professor at the Institute for Public Policy at the University College Dublin. Uh, it's my great pleasure to hand over to you, Mary.
Thank you, Alana, and thank you so much for organizing this event. It's wonderful to see such a knowledgeable group uh, gathered together to, to discuss and debate these important issues and to have this conversation. So just briefly, I was just taking notes as the different speakers were speaking, and these are my sort of top line captures. Um, Professor Julia Davidson spoke of children captive at home and increasingly online. And, and I agree, in fact, a Stanford prof has said that screen time has soared during the pandemic and predicts a period of epic withdrawal once schools and activities and social life returns to normal. Um, I also want to take the opportunity to congratulate Prof Davidson on her OBE. It's a wonderful acknowledgement of your work to date and also the importance of this research area. And I can concur with Prof Davidson's remarks that there is too little funding at the moment in terms of tackling uh, uh, online CSA. Victoria Jepson from the Home Office um, talked about new strategies to tackle CSA. And I agree with her um, uh, statement that the UK is leading in this area in terms of attempting to address CSA, but also leading in the context the larger context of online harms. And uh, Prof Davison and I, through, through the Institute, the ICC, we've been working very closely with DCMS, looking at the online safety technology sector, which, which will deliver um, technology solutions to these sort of technology facilitated problem and criminal behaviors. The point is that CSA is a big data problem in terms of variety and velocity and volume of this content. And we will need AI and ML solutions to tackle the problem. The good news is that there is a thriving, emerging online safety technology sector in the UK, or as we describe it as safety tech. And effectively, we've had 20 or 30 years of cybersecurity in terms of trying to tackle online harm issues. But cybersecurity focuses on protecting your data, your networks, and your systems. It does not protect what it is to be human online. And this is the opportunity for cyber safety and safety technologies to actually step in and provide that protection. Your data is never going to suffer from low self-esteem. Your data is never going to feel the re need for revenge. Your data is never going to be sexually coerced online. And that's why it's important that we invest in online safety technology, safety tech initiatives, and DCMS is doing great work in that area. And we are delighted to be supporting that work. Dr. Jo Bryce took us through her DSHAME um, research project. And I think two findings really, you know, were, were significant um, from my point of view. One was, that the, her finding regarding how youth problematic um, behaviors regarding sexual harassment appears to mimic that of adult offenders. And the second one that over half of the sample surveyed said that they would not report the, this abuse or harassment to an adult. And that also resonates with current research that we're doing on the Horizon 2020 project, Prof Davidson and I are working on this uh, called CC Drivers, where we're looking at uh, Suler's work in terms of ODE, online disinhibition effect, and specifically the consequences regarding uh, the minimization um, of, of um, authority online in terms of there are no authority, you know, the reason that we often see this uh, cyber feral behavior is because there is appearance that there is nobody in charge. And the reality is that there's nobody in charge. And this evidence um, for me supported that premise. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey DeMarco actually said he was going to cram 15 years of research into 18 minutes, which he did very well. Speaking about motivations of offenders, arguing about greater context and talking about how we need, um, how young people, our parents, our educators need to learn how to navigate this digital world and how overwhelming it can be. And this is an important construct because it touches on cyberspace as an environment. This is not just a transactional medium. When you log on, you know, when you do what we're doing now, you're entering into a powerful psychological space. But we can 
apply learnings, traditional learnings from psychology in terms of Prochansky's work in environmental psychology to actually understand the impact of this new environment of cyberspace on human behavior. Jeffrey said that kids said, I you know, when, when, when they did something inappropriate online, I just didn't know, I got carried away. And the parents argued, I thought that they were safe. And, and that's the sort of the juxtaposition between those two is that while you think, think your children are safe upstairs in their bedroom, they're in this powerful environment of cyberspace and they're navigating often sometimes some very bad neighborhoods on the deep web, on dark webs, and on the dark web and some actually accessing dark nets, which are criminal convergence, uh, convergence settings in an age of technology. Uh, thank you to uh, Jeffrey also argued that we shouldn't fear monger. Um, I don't agree with fear mongering, but I think we should be very concerned. Um, I think that that we see this constant debate and I often describe it as there's a cohort that I describe as online harm deniers. And I think that we need this powerful voice from this group to say, it's not all okay. We need to pay attention to what's happening in a cyber context and we need to work together to create a safer and more cyber security for all of us, but specifically for those young people who are growing up in cyberspace. Uh, thank you to Tink Palmer, who actually moderated the second panel. Uh, Dr. Ver Victoria Baines gave um, a very interesting presentation in terms of evidence-based policy and a deep dive into some statistical reporting anomalies. And she also argues that some of the data sources are unreliable, which I would agree with. Tink, however, pointed, uh, Victoria pointed to the fact that we probably need more evidence directly from children in terms of the authenticity, um, authenticity and reliability of the information and the data. But equally, Tink has pointed out how difficult it often is for children to report what has happened. And we do know from our research findings that very often children fear the consequences of reporting this behavior or, or reporting some um, negative event in cyber contexts in that their um, ability to access the internet may be uh, limited by their parents or their devices might be confiscated. And that can be a powerful barrier to reporting. And finally, uh, Sam and Bailey really introduced a reality check to say, while we are here conferencing together in cyberspace, an offender is currently before the courts this afternoon charged with grooming thousands of children. He also produced some very strong data and evidence to say that in 30 years, we've moved from 7,000 to 17 million CSA images. We cannot deny these hard facts. Um, and for those who wish to minimize these issues, these facts speak volumes. He also pointed out that over 850 offenders are being apprehended a month and that on a, on a positive note, over a thousand children a month are being safeguarded. Evidence from, from professionals like Simon Bailey are critical. Why? Because it gives us real-time frontline reports of the CSA problem. He also spoke about pathways to CSA and the normalization and socialization of harmful behaviors online. And I would just like to point out that while we talk about online harm in an abstract context, very recently, we've had the first real world exemplification of what online harm in terms of hate speech, in terms of the no normalization and socialization of abnormal behavior, in terms of the distortion of truth in a cyber context spills over into the real world. And we saw this on Capitol Hill recently, and we saw the, the dramatic and tragic consequences of that online harm spilling over into the real world. And Simon also spoke about challenges with encryption. So I would like to summarize that by saying, well, in, in a civilized cyber society, we have three aims. We have an aim of privacy, we have a name of vitality of the tech industry, and we also have a name of collective security. And none of those aims should have primacy over the other. In other words, privacy by means of encryption cannot 
uh, have primacy over collective security. And it will become increasingly to uh, difficult to deliver on collective security when there are domains that are beyond the law. So basically, just to summarize, first of all, we need to have a paradigm shift and start conceptualizing the online space as an environment, as cyberspace, and understand that impact on humans. And disciplines such as mine, cyber psychology, can help in this regard. Secondly, we need to invest in research that explores the benefits, risks, and harms online, and does so in an age-appropriate context. And of these, risk is probably most important because we can use that knowledge to actually mitigate harm. We also need to invest in metrics to standardize reporting of CSA to capture the full depth and scale of the problem. We need to consider developmental stages. Uh, our current research at ICC, which will be publishing shortly, will be looking at stages of cyber cognitive development. You know, what's the best age to give a child a smartphone so that we can support parents and educators. We also need to support the government in terms of the work that is being done to address online harms. Parents, caregivers and educators need support and industry, and this has been a theme of this conference, has a duty of care in terms of accountability and responsibility. And finally, we need to leverage new technologies to provide tech solutions to technology facilitated problem behaviors. Thank you for your time and thank you everybody for your contribution. Back to you, Elena. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much for highlighting these important key messages so well. And thank you all for staying with us until the very end. It's 3.30 on the dot, so we've done beautifully well. So all I need to say is just thanking you for attending. Thanks to the DCMS, the Mary Collin Foundation, the UCAS Evidence Groups, uh, Middlesex University and UEL for their support. And of course, to all the guests, uh, numerous guests that never dropped out throughout, uh, which is great. I have the recordings. I will be sharing it with you. I hope you found uh, the event valuable.